Apple FM in the community. The outside broadcast team, with thanks to the League of Friends at Musgrove Park Hospital. 97.3 Apple FM. Gardner's Question Time, live from Vivery Park in Taunton. Yes, welcome ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Taunton Flower Show 2016. We are live from the demonstration marquee here in Vivery Park this afternoon. Uh, there is a fairly full packed demonstration marquee, there are very few seats remaining, but I'm sure people will sit themselves down. I can see lots of people at the back waiting to come in and that's lovely. Uh, we have a panel of experts here for Gardener's Question Time this afternoon. And I would like to start by introducing them all to you first and foremost. We'll start at this end. Uh, they say age before beauty, but knowing if I was to actually say that, someone would say pearls before swine. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Andrew Pittman from Moncton Elm Garden Centre. And uh, the rose between two thorns. <laughs> Mr. Vic Veria, our very own Vic Veria, MBE. Uh, Vic was the head gardener for Taunton Deanborough Council for... Is that right, head gardener, head part of parks? Pardon? Parks and amenities. Sorry, I do apologise. Yep, for donkey's years. No, he knew Noah. Uh, and then finally... I would like to introduce you to uh, Royal Horticultural Society gold medal winner for show gardens at Chelsea Flower Show 2015, Mr. Darren Hawkes. So the idea of this is that you come to us with your questions. It is a very warm day, 25, 26 degrees out there. It is obviously shaded, but in a marquee you might as well be in a greenhouse, which is rather apt for gardeners' question time, I think. Nevertheless, may I please ask who has a first question? Lady right here, we'll start right beside us. Could you please tell us your name, where you're from, and what your question is? Margaret Yelland from Hello. Lyme Regis. Oh, nice, beautiful area, beautiful. How may we help you? Um, I re very recently bought a grapevine, a dessert one, for a cold greenhouse. Now, how do you um, recommend I grow it? In the soil, in the greenhouse, or in a large pot? And if it's in a pot, what compost should I use? Who... <laughs> Yeah, we, if anyone was here yesterday, you know why I'm laughing about compost. Um, who would like to take this first? Andrew? Would you? Yeah, by all means, please, Andrew, go ahead. Right, well, welcome. Um, greenha um, grapes in greenhouses, yeah, works very, very well. Quite often, people plant them outside of the greenhouse, take out a pane of glass, and then actually train them in. So, therefore, the plant can look after itself on the outside, so it doesn't rely on you watering it and looking after it quite so much. If you do put it in a pot, you need to put it in a big pot because it's going to be very vigorous. Or you could plant it in the soil in the greenhouse. And I will use John Innings number three, which is a bit <laughs> controversial because yesterday... Um, Pepper Greenwood, yes. ...didn't like John Innings number three. But I would say in this instance, that would be what you'd need. Thank you. Thank Back you. to that, Vic. Anybody else? Vic? Yeah, no, I would, I would endorse that if you possibly can. I mean, all the old vineries, they always were planted outside the greenhouse. Otherwise, you're going to take up such a lot of room. I think in a pot, then you're going to have difficulty in managing it, as Andrew said, it'll look after itself. And if you tend to not water it, then you, you know, you're in problems. It will not fruit as, as good. So if you can do that, and it's not a huge task, if you've got a brick base or is it... Is it glass to the ground um it's an alu aluminium yes greenhouse. but it's glass to the ground yes yeah so take out one panel right. or even even get a glazier to cut half cut. a sheet so you can keep half mm -hmm. it just to keep the warmth in but just so uh, outside and take it in and then start to train it thank you very much you. Are, we, are we all happy with that do you like to have a go as well by all means please do darren go ahead i'd just like to ask how, how big is the greenhouse oh um eight by ten and do you grow other things Toma in it? Tomatoes, cucumber, melon. So it's going to be quite stuffed come well, the end of next plant summer. It, uh, yes, I shan't plant it till all that's more or less, you know, out yeah. of the greenhouse. But next oh, year, I see think, next year. Yeah, I'll have next to put year, less. do you think they'll be? Yeah, fine. Yes. You, you know that's going to eventually 
take over your greenhouse. Yes. yes. It is quite a vigorous plant, then, yeah, is it? Yeah. It's, but yeah. I think it's worth doing, and I'd agree with these guys. Well, yeah. John Innes, <laughs> number three. Yeah, well, yeah, J.I. J- number three, uh, also lots of grit. Yes, for yeah. drainage. Yeah. Yes, yep. thank you. Excellent. Thank, thank you, you very much indeed. Thank you very much for your question. The lady behind with the beautiful hat, thank you very much indeed. Could you please tell us your name and where you're from? Uh, my name is Doreen Woodrow. I come from North Devon, just on the edge of Exmoor. Lovely. Very beautiful. What's your question for the panel, please? We have an, a very old wisteria growing over the wall of our cottage. It has never been properly cared for and it just rambles wildly. About this time of the year, we have to cut it back because it gets into the roof of the the, the house. I know that's wrong. We don't get any flowers ever on it. I don't want to lose it, but I just don't know what to do about it. So it's a a, a what? Sorry, it's a very... Could you point it in towards your mouth a bit more? There we are. Thank you. A wisteria. A wisteria. Thank you very much indeed. So... Wisterias, they were mentioned yesterday. They're a beautiful plant. What can the lady do about it? What can be done? I don't think... Don't be too precious about the fact that you are pruning it now. Because no. although uh, really you should be doing prune in September and another one in January, February, mm. I've got wisteria against the front of my house and I have to prune it now for exactly the same reason, that it gets in under the eaves, into yeah. the gutters, and does need keeping in check. Mm. Um, how old is it? I would think about 30 years old. Oh, okay. So it's but it's, it's very twisted. It, I don't think it's ever been pruned, so you've got all these things coming up and... Well, I think the very in. Uh, best thing about wisteria is that architectural twistedness that you describe. Mm. And by mm. hard pruning, you'll reveal some of that shape that will be exposed over the winter and will Im- kind of right. improve the front of the house. Mm. And actually, wisteria is one of those plants that responds brilliantly to hard pruning. So I take it back really hard uh, on all growth to six buds in September, late September, and then again mm-hmm. maybe in February back to two buds. As little as and, that? Yeah. Yeah, really? It, I mean, that would be quite... The harder you prune, really? the more flowers you'll wow. get. Okay. But also, <laughs> don't, be, don't be afraid to prune from the base where you've got lots of suckers coming it's up coming, and, and yes. try and concentrate on a sort of very neat framework before you get to the foliage. Lovely. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. You. Is that Andrew? Can we just ask, is it in a nice sunny position? Yes, it's on a, a, a south-facing wall. We're just wondering why it's not flowering. Well, I think it's because it gets hacked at this time of the year. And yeah, but I, that shouldn't be the case, mm-hmm. really. Um, you know, wisteria quite often thrive on neglect, but they also mm-hmm. thrive on, you know, even if you over-prune them, you should yeah. get some flower. Mm-hmm. And you've never had flower on it at all. The, the only year it did flower was... Um, we just left it and didn't didn't cut it at all, but it got absolutely massive and and, and then it did flower. But it, 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 was it, it got low. it got massive after uh, when it was left or af- yes. after you gave it a good pruning back? Yeah. No, no, no. No, right, so. okay. If anyone's thinking of buying a wisteria, make sure you buy a grafted one. If you buy a grafted wisteria, it should flower within the sort of the first eighteen months, two years of having it. If it's a seed raised one, you could be waiting ten years. Wow. So it is worth paying a little bit extra and having a grafted one. Okay. Thank you very much, Vic. Thank you. The only, well, the only thing I would add, I would slightly differ from Darren in that I would go a little bit harder in that early prune and then not do anything until all the foliage was out and then perhaps end of June, July, when they start putting out these long, straggly ones, then do my second prune then... Mm-hmm. But I would certainly um, agree with everything else. But I think you need to get some feed in there, I would have thought, as well. Maybe it's lacking. I mean, if you've got a little simple soil testing kit, it may be that it's badly lacking potash all round. Other than you say it's plenty of growth because it's going everywhere. But it may be just short of that one element, potash, which it needs to produce flower buds Uh, and flower. So I think I would... Um, if you haven't got access just to straightforward sulfate of potash, then I would use high uh, feeds like Tom or I, any of these which contain lots of um, liquid potash, and give it a good feed. Keep watering and watering and bumping the potash up and try that. Oh, yeah. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much indeed. Thank you very much. 
Uh, who's next with a question? Uh, we're going to go over to this side in the, on the far... There's a lady just at the back there with a beautiful flurry top. Thank you very much indeed. Adrian's making his way to you now. No, no, you, the, the, the oh. lady here. There we are. If you could point the microphone directly into your mouth. Hello, Hello. I'm Chris Legg from Somerton. And I've got a sample there which I'd like somebody to... Adrian, um, could you bring the sample down? What is it you're showing us, please? It's um, a big bush or even a tree which grows about 15, 20 feet. The pink flowers came out in June. They were sort of four-petaled and flat and that uh, sort of coal uh, shade of pink. Right, yes, it is. It's... Uh, it's well, the uh, experts are saying viburnum. Okay. They're, uh, they're, I can hear chunterings and mumberings under their breath. But it's a, a very nice shade of pink on that flower, isn't it? Yes, viburnum, viburnums are generally white, but this is a pink one. It was absolutely massed with flower. And you, it's just that you, you simply didn't know what it was. That's exactly. what it is. Yes. Okay. So, gentlemen, who can answer what you think this might be? We think... <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, uh, you're not under oath here don't worry <laughs> right and um, we're looking at um half a half a flower <laughs> I'm afraid a, it's half a bit a squashed squashed. and one leaf that looks a little bit limp but half a um, squashed flower yes. we actually think yes. it's a viburnum and we think it's viburnum placatum and if it is it will grow almost in layers Yes. Is it sort of layered in its habit? It is, and it tends to droop a little bit rather yeah. than being flat That's layers. it, it'll be a placatum. Right. There's several varieties. There's one called Mauricii, which is very popular, but that is more white than that one, so I'm not quite sure. You did say yeah. that they normally come in a white format, but this one's in pink. Is that is the white is the standard then, is it? The white is the more common one, yeah. Right. They've got a, a sort of blush of pink on them, but... Um, but the major thing is the fact that it grows in those beautiful layers. Mm. It's sort of a bit like a wedding cake as it goes. Yes, it is similar, And then similar, with the yes. flowers, and the flowers are flat as well, so... And you think it's a what, sorry again? Viburnum placatum. Viburnum placatum. So there you are. I trust that that answers your question for you. And, and you say Mauricii. We're saying Mauricii because we don't know the pink form. <laughs> 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 okay. Vic's, Vic's usually got a book that he could have had a... <laughs> Can I, uh, just on a general one, there's nothing to do with the, direct with the question, but if ever you come to gardeners' question time, those sort of things, and you do bring specimens, try and bring something, you know, at least twice, three times bigger <laughs> than that. Not just not well, you, was, but... Was, you're not advocating it, her bringing the whole branch. It, that's, that's, not, that's, that's not what it's about. No, this is, but it, but it does little... help identification. Uh, yes. you know, if you can pick up bits and pieces of it... Um, rather than sort of... I, I was being a bit naughty <laughs> pinching that bit where I shouldn't, so... <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you, you're happy with your answer? Yes, yeah, that's yes, lovely. Thank you. thank you very much indeed. So, uh, can we, Adrian, you're about to have your run for your money. The gentleman at the front here, the gentleman here would like to ask a question. Sir, can we take your name first of all, please? My name is Mike Berryman. I live at Creechleyfield, Taunton. Lovely. Thank you very much, Mike. What's your question for the panel? My question is, when is the best time to uh, prune soft fruit, like black currants, um, gooseberries, and all that sort of thing? Right, there you go. Who would like to take this one? When, what is the best time of year to prune soft fruit? Well, they all vary, obviously, depending on what type you've got. But if you look at some... Um, Go commercial now, and the black currant boys now. I mean, they have these huge machines that actually harvest the fruit and take the whole stem off, which eases the picking. So they do the two jobs under one. So they actually cut it off at, even at this time of the year. You don't need to be that harsh in, in, in saying your allotment or whatever. But normally they're, they're pruned after you've finished um, picking your fruit, you can do it straight away with black currants straight down because by that time you should, if you've been feeding and looking after it, um, if you've got lots of nice new growth start yet, yeah, yes, yeah, coming the bottle. Well, that's the new growth which will then ripen up to produce your fruit for next year. So you do it once you've got the fruit on, you take the whole of that thing out, get rid of that, and then with the new structure. With red currants, it's slightly different. You don't take the whole thing out because you're looking at it on a more mature wood. But again, it can be done, um, well, early autumn, early autumn when the leaves are off. 
gooseberries, it depends on gooseberries. There's all sorts of ways of going gooseberries and pruning them. Um, first of all, are they just ordinary open bushes or are they on cordons? No, they're just open bushes. Just normal bushes. Well, again, I would wait until the autumn. Um, what you find is they have American gooseberry mildew, which a lot of them you find on the tips of the shoots going grey with that mildew coming in. Not a lot you can do because we don't like spraying too much on chemicals, not certainly when you're, you've got an edible crop like a gooseberry. But by tipping them, even at this time of the year, if you've got any of those shoots, you can tip them off now and burn them rather than compost them. And then in the autumn, again, when the leaves are off, uh, that's the time to prune. Now, if you've ever, if you get good crops with them? Very good, yeah. Very good crops. But what are they like to pick? A bit of a devil, aren't they, normally? Especially with the thorns. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, there are thornless varieties, but they are awful for harvesting. So if you look in any of the good books, look in the RHS books, what you're trying to do is to get a manager book a bush with the air can circulate through it. Think of a, a wine goblet, that sort of shape. So you're taking out crisscrossing branches inside and looking at the structure of the plant so that individual stems that you can get in without having to wear big stout gloves to actually pick the fruit. So that's the first thing. Once the leaves are on, any dead, dying, crisscrossing, remove that and then start to look carefully at the structure of the plant, of the leaf, and then you spur back, basically, exactly that Darren was saying and, and Andrew and all about the wisteria, cutting back with so many buds, you've got your main stem and you've got all these little shoots, you stub them back then to two, maybe three buds, so you still keep that main frame all the time, and then introduce lots of little short spurs all the way, and it's on those spurs that your gooseberries will form. So autumn, really, other than your black currants, when you can get out at any time, really. Anything to add? Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, just uh, can you make sure you keep your microphone near to you? I've had a comment from the box. They're saying they've had to turn it up to, so they could hear you. Thank you very much. <laughs> you have to keep them in line every now and then. These celebs, you know, they're just, they're terrible. Uh, who's the next? I have a lady at the back, right at the very back there. She's holding up something and then we'll, we are going to try and squeeze as many in as possible. We're 20 minutes yeah. into this already, ladies mm -hmm. and gents. Hello there. Good Hello. afternoon. What's Hello. your name, please? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm Doris Chard. Hello, I come Doris. from Shaftesbury um, near Dorset, up in Dorset actually. Beautiful. And I'm growing my runner beans in a big tub. Yep. Um, loads and loads of flowers, but the flowers are just dropping off and there's no, no beans forming. So, so you, you've got runner bean flowers, yes. but no actual beans then no forming. No beans are forming, Is that no. a pollination thing? They're conflabbing at the moment on the main top de table. So Vic's going to kick it off, point to the microphone to his mouth. Right. <laughs> I'll, I'll did you see what off. I did there? Notorious. Anything growing in tubs, as you know, especially, look, look today. I mean, I've got loads of tomatoes in grow bags and tubs, and uh, yeah. I made certain I gave them a really good watering this morning because, I mean, it would have evaporated, gone. So your tubs mm. of kidney beans are really going to suffer. So... Mm. First of all, is that if you're, you, you're obviously, you plan to do this, so yeah. you should ensure that the compass that you were putting in was holding plenty of moisture, moisture retaining compass. Mm. We won't go into which model or make you're going to use, but mm. um, <laughs> there, are, there are a number of products that you use in the Go on, if you baskets. had to, what would you? Go on. Well, I would go for certainly no less than a John in his number two, and then That's I would add um, maybe some additional organic material in there mm -hmm. and in a container it's not a bad idea if you uh, any of you have hanging baskets and use a product called swell swell gel yeah oh that's, that's the that's the little tiny it's thing it's a little gel which to. swells and holds moisture so yeah. you can chuck that mm -hmm. in and it saves you watering quite as often mix that in with your compass right and um it's mm -hmm. literally water 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 yes yeah, so um, i'm I water every night. You, you know, do. they've got plenty of water. Yeah. And they've had a liquid feed as well. 
Right. Last year I grew them in tubs and they were a fantastic crop. Well, it's just the, the beans, the beans yeah, aren't forming. I think that's yeah. It, it could be the variation in the watering, you know, either too too little or too too much. Mm. But also, um, mm. you, they're definitely dropping and not being picked off. Mm -hmm, they're dropping. They're dropping. You, you you you're definitely sure that only sparrows love them. Um, they they love the flowers and they don't mm. eat them. They just little. They're they're in there looking for aphids and things and they pick them. And, yeah. and the poor old flowers drop off, and then uh, mm. that's the end of it, really. So you think that might be the problem, do you? Have you got good drainage on them? Yes, yes. You haven't got them sat in a saucer or anything no, no, like no, that? No, 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 no. They're on these little, um, little pot feet. Right. Because sometimes if you put them in a saucer, when you water, they sit mm. in water overnight. No, they're not. No. And then you end up with root death. And yeah, then and it's the same <clears throat> thing. They can't take the moisture up. Mm -hmm. But they're in John Inns as well. I always use John Inns. I used a combination of John Inns number two and pot and compost. Number two. There we are. Right. And they're stood on pot feet, you know, so they're not stood in saucers. It does sound like you're doing the right thing, certainly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, Darren, any ideas? Uh, so a different variety. Well, Maybe. these I bought. I bought these as plant last year. I grew Scarlet Emperor. Um, but these I bought as plants, so I don't know what they were. So maybe it's the plants. Mm. Yeah, I sow yourself. Yeah. Okay. All right. Mm. So it's possible that it could actually be mm. sparrows yeah. coming for the aph coming for aphids on them, okay. right, which is an unusual turn of events because I wouldn't mm. have expected that. Mm. That's possible. Gentlemen, uh, before we thank you very much for your question. That's I appreciate right. that very much indeed. Before we yeah, go any further, okay. um, there are people out there that won't understand what all this, the numbers are in reference to things like John Innes compost. Can, you, can somebody explain what the different numbers, what they relate relative to? Yeah, very, very quickly. John Innes number one is, a, is the equivalent of like the multi-purpose that you've right. got in the garden centres with. Number one has got fertilizer in it, but it's not hard and um, strong enough that it's going to ha um, deny little seedlings. You can actually sow seedlings in your first potting on. John in his number two has almost got double the amount of the actual fertilizers in right. it. Where number three um, has got, it's not double, but it's about a third more again okay, of the but... actual thing. They're all based on what we call a ratio of 732, 7 loam, 3 peat, 2 sand. Right. And then you have um, superphosphates and other ingredients which make it up. All the compost has been sterilized, so there's no yeah. weed seeds, no insects, nasty wireworms and things. And that's it really, it's a 732 ratio and it's really the strength of the fertilizer. So if you've got something like an oleander or a hydrangea bush that you're saying you're going to put into a big tub yep. and it's going to stay there for two or three years, John in his number three <laughs> is the one because it's, it'll go on in the food. But don't start off a young plant, Yeah. any of you, don't start off a young plant because you think, well, it's going to grow into a big thing and put it in the number three straight away because the fertilizer will be too strong and kill off your roots. So you progress one, two, three. So as, it's, as it months. gets stronger, you give it a yeah. different type. In, in as layman's needs. terms, yep. that's it. And there's just the three. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, there, there is a seed composition. Oh, right. Okay. John which in his different... seed, which is purely for sowing seeds. And that has a different composition again. Absolutely. I see. Yes. Okay, thank you very much indeed. I the only other thing to bear in mind with compost is when you buy it, it only has about eight weeks of feed in it. So even if you buy a good brand of compost, after eight weeks, you need to be either liquid feeding or putting a slow-release feed with it. So don't forget to do that or else you won't get very good results. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, so to the next question. Gentleman right at the end there, um, and we'll look elsewhere for other questions. We've got... Half an hour left. We've still plenty of time. Sir, good afternoon. What's your name, please, and where are you from? John Rich. Hello, John. Where from are you from? Puritan. Oh, lovely. Okay, just outside of Bridgewater. Yeah. And what's uh, your question for the panel? I've got two questions. Yep. One for me, one for senior management. Oof. <laughs> senior management. Uh, what, if anything, can be done about rust on broad beans and onions, etc.? Right. Rust on broad beans. We're going to do this in a two-parter. Rust on broad beans. I, I actually, can I, is that what you're saying? Is that, 
There really isn't. Okay, go ahead, please. Well, I'll start off because Andrew, no, I'm not. A, but the short answer is nothing. Simply because, uh, as you know, the regulated bodies now, which um, have come in over the years, and I think rightly so, regulated the chemicals we use, and a lot of them are considered as nasties today, and chemicals that we could readily use and were pumped on by the gallon, no longer. So as far as the rust on onions and beans and things, no, you've just got to let it run its course, basically. And will it? Will it run its course? Will it? Will it get rid of itself in the end? What? What is it? It's, what is the uh, rust? What is? It? Is it like a, an organism? Basically, there's nothing you can do. Um, the best thing, the best line of defence, is to actually keep the plants stress-free from the very beginning, because prevention is better than cure. If you look soon as you get the first signs of it if you can pick the affected leaves off and just sort of nip it in the bud Literally. that will help but it's one of those things that you sort of you think you're looking at them every day and then you look another day and they're like covered in it but the best thing to do is to actually pick off those affected leaves there's okay. no chemical control available on the amateur market at all anymore okay thank you on that one now the, the boss's question <laughs> She's just lifted some crocosmia. Oh, we had a, mess, a question about crocosmia uh, yesterday. There's a string of like little baby donuts below, <laughs> below the top corn. What should we do with those? Plant, replant the lot or? So uh, a, string of, a string of donuts. Are they icing colored? Are they icing covered? It's not that kind of no, donut. No, no. Not Sorry. that kind of donut. No. But, <laughs> I suppose the question is, do you like them? Could you pass the microphone over to the uh, to the management? I, I have got all the <laughs> colours: the orange ones, and the yellow ones, and the red. And so the, this is a cultivar. This is the Lucifer. Right, that's lovely. got a bit, you yeah. know, rumbustrous. So I've dug them out, but I want to put some back in. But they've got all these long things. Well, it's it's generating new corn. So I would replant, but I'd also make sure with Lucifer you stake, because as you say. They, Tall. Yeah, and they're so heavy with their foliage that first bit of wind and they're over. Mm. So stake early. And, uh, yeah, if you pot them on, give them to friends, you're going to always generate more than you can reuse with Crocosmia. But, um, yeah, enjoy the fact that it's a very easy one to propagate from. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. Andrew? It is the wrong time of year to be doing it now, though. Too late. I've gone out this Oh, too late. You've done them this morning, she says. You... Oh Cause dear! Because they're, they're in full growth at the moment, they re yeah. But they, you need to let the tops die right back down, so the goodness goes back into the corn, and then you would. <laughs> we, we, we do sell them. Obviously. He will be glad to see you. <laughs> okay, thank you very much indeed. You are listening to ninety-seven point three Apple FM, coming to you live from the two thousand and sixteen. Uh, uh, flower show here in Taunton. My words le nearly lost me then. And yes, we are here in the beautiful Vibery Park. It is a swelteringly hot day today. Uh, I can see people wafting themselves in front of me. It is very warm in here, I'm afraid. Are you gentlemen okay? Are you ready for the next question? So, I, uh, gentlemen at the back, uh, this is worrying because this is a friend that's actually come down to help me with IT for Apple FM, but he's come all the way from Manchester to help me, just to help. So go on, Danny, what's your question? I'm a multi talented guy. Um, oh. I've recently given a chilli plant. It's a uh, hybrid tangerine, a ternary tangerine. I've not a clue how to look after it. What do I do? I was expecting something sarcastic pointed at me and for him to come out with a nice, sensible question. I'm delighted, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Gentlemen, um, a chilli plant, a tangerine... What was it, sorry, Danny? It's a tenery tangerine. A tenery apparently tangerine chilli plant. Apparently it's incredibly hot. Apparently it's incredibly foods. hot. How can you look after it? How do you look after chilli plants? Right, well, chilli plants are very, very popular at the moment and... Um, the thing you need to do is to put it in a nice sunny position outdoors. It's sunny in the UK, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it is today. Uh, they like a nice sunny position. Um, Does it have to be outdoors? It, can it be indoors? It, well, it can go indoors if it's in a greenhouse, but if you put it on in a normal house conditions, it won't be light enough for it unless you put it on a sunny windowsill. Okay. So it would be either a greenhouse, sunny windowsill, or out on the patio. 
um, then you want to put it in a bigger pot than you've got it in. Maybe um, a loam-based compost just to give it a little bit of oomph. Feed it with tomato feed and allow it to dry out slightly in between waterings because it doesn't like being too wet. In the main arena, we've got the military boundary. Thank you very think much. That will help. Yeah. Anybody Thank else? You. Is that it? Thank you very much indeed. Who else has a question, please? Uh, we'll come to the lady here first, then the gentleman next. Adrian. You're doing very well. At this rate, you will be losing some weight, my friend. My weak exercise. Yay. Thank you very much. Hello there. Put Hello. your name, please. Where Chris, are you from? Christy Warren from Tynmouth. Thank you. Oh, it's beautiful, Tynmouth. Lovely. Very nice. What's your question for the panel? My osteospernums are beginning to look a bit tired lately. Your, your oste, oste... Osteospernum. Osteospernum. Okay. I grew them from cuttings ooh, a good five years plus ago. Is it worth getting rid of them and starting afresh, or will feeding or cutting back do some good? Ooh, Vic? Um, plenty of cutting material on them or not? There is, yeah. Ideal time now, I would propagate them now. Get a four or five inch flower pot, yeah. good sandy, uh, gritty mixture, um, take the cuttings off three four inches, and then with a pen, something like that, just put about four or five of those right on the edge if you've got a clay pot um, out of the direct sun if you've got a cold frame obviously put them in there a lot of people do osteospermums or argaranthemums they're all in the same family um, propagate them in this way because um, they're not fully hardy as you know at certain parts of the country depending where you live and um, they, they, they do this to perpetuate them rather than bother to keep the plants year in, year out, always taking cuttings, having new material, and they flower very well on the new material. So rather than the fear of losing it, I would now get some, get some cuttings taken off, overwinter them, and then you've got um, you know, to go ahead next year. Yeah, I but also, once you've done that, I would then cut them back because there's every chance and they'll regrow and... Um, well, Darren, you grow lots of them in Cornwall, so... Uh, I'd do what Vic suggested, but I'd also be tempted to uh, cut back hard oh. and then in the winter lift and divide and replant a half the size plant just so that it can have new they vigor and big. Yeah, take <laughs> off. I mean, that's the great thing about osteos from cuttings or from propagation yeah, I grow through cuttings division. every year, but usually give them away, so perhaps yeah. I'll have to use them myself for a change. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think thin out what you've got, mm. and if you've got a backup of cuttings, then you're going to have a good stock for just to be on the safe side. Passing on. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Very you. nice. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much for your question. Adrian, if you could uh, give the uh, microphone to the gentleman. There we are. Thank you very much indeed. So, what's your name, please? So Chris from Andover. Um, Thank you. Andover. Andover. Long Andover. way. Yeah, well, Gosh. travel. Um, looking for suggestions. We are in a, a newish house. Uh, the area that we're looking to plant something in is northeast facing. It's a bit of sunshine in the morning. Uh, we're looking for something that will come to about a metre, metre 30 in height, something like that, up in front of the window. The other thing is the soil in the area is really clay. It goes from being sort of potter's clay, ready to be made into a pot, into cement in the space of a few days. So would it be better in a pot? What would you suggest? And can you pick something that's pronounceable, please, because I'm really rubbish at remembering plant names. So... There we are. Was it south? Sorry, so it was a... Northeast facing. A northeast so it gets a bit of sunshine facing. in the morning, but not, not a huge amount of sunshine. So something partially shaded. So you've got heavy, heavy clay. Heavy clay. Do you want it to be evergreen or deciduous or...? Not really too, too fast. We're looking for... We're fairly open on that. Something preferably that has a bit of colour at some point in the year, so it isn't just green would be better, but if, it's, if your suggestion is for evergreen, that's fine. There, there's... Uh, I'd be tempted maybe by hydrangea. There's a... Um, Hydrangea serrata, which is a smaller hydrangea and beautiful colours, both on the foliage and on the flower. Um, we grow them on, uh, in one garden that I've looked after for years on really heavy clay. And they took a while to get established and we did add a lot of grit and we mulch heavily with uh, manure. It's a farm, so it's readily available. And try and work that in to improve the topsoil. And they've done brilliantly. I think it was sort of 18 months, two years before they got going. And then they, they took off. And the great thing about Serata is it's never going to get so big that it's going to come up above the window. So um, I'd have a look at, yeah, have and a look would, at that. Would you suggest sort of um, doing the manure treatment now and then putting that in in spring or something? Would that be the best thing? 
I would. Um, I think you probably are better off with the spring planting, given the, how heavy the ground's going to be, just because you don't really want the plant overwintering in cold, wet clay when it's just been planted. So uh, you could do the preparation now, yeah, and then plant out early spring. Um, that's what I suggest. Andrew. I'd agree with that. Um, I would also recommend the good old-fashioned Neuronymous. Neuronymous is very tough, very easy, reliable. It's got a variegated leaf. You can clip it into a nice dome if you want to, or you can let it go wild and do its own thing. And the other thing I would recommend is, if you come to the garden centre, and I think you're a real no-hoper, I let you buy a, a potentilla. Potentillas are so easy and hardy, and they flower for a long period of time. So if you went for a nice yellow Euronymus with a, with a yellow um, flowering potentilla next to it, or one of the white and green variegated with a white potentilla, you'd be on the right road. And a similar thing with the soil, put the manure, manure the soil? Both of those are so tough. You know, they, they will almost go anywhere, but when, with any new planting, plenty of compost under it. And if it is, if you dig the hole out, fill it with water, and just make sure that water goes away. If it doesn't go away, you need to make sure that happens. So you dig over the bottom, put plenty of horticultural grit in there, then you put the planting mix on top of that. Fantastic. So drainage is the key. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Adrian, if you wouldn't mind. Who has a question next, please? The gentleman at the front here. I remember from yesterday, sir. I remember you from yesterday. What's your you name, do, sir? You do indeed. It's Alan Cavill from Taunton. Ah, uh, yes, okay. I have okay. a question for the panel. It's on roses, obviously not bad. Okay. Out of my comfort zone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, black spot seems to be pretty prevalent in Taunton. Um, I've heard that if I add maize meal, really? you know, the gr ground maize, around the base, that will counteract the, the black spot spores. Has the panel had any experience of that? Darren. No, I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> Straight up. Your honesty is refreshing. Thank you very much indeed. Where, where did, who was it, who recommended it? Was that in one, one of the magazines, you know, it's ah. just, just a recent article. And um, apparently there's some symbolic relationship between the two uh, spores. And okay. um, one cancels the other one out, apparently. And well, I just wondered before I sort of go to that process, whether there's any experience with yourselves or even in the room. Are they, are they new roses? They've been in two years now. And do, do, you, do you know where you bought them from? Were they from a garden centre? <laughs> Did you buy them from a, a local garden centre by no, any chance, no, Mr do, Cavill? David Austin's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Other ones do exist, of course. Absolutely. Product yeah, placement, yeah. etc. Et so, I'm, I'm, like I said, I'm very much out of my comfort zone with... Well, uh, yeah, I'd give it a go. I think you're not going to lose anything. No, no, no. And, I, just, um, I just wondered, you know... There was, there was no sort of uh, amounts or anything like that. It was a bit hit and miss. And if there's someone that's already been there, you know, why reinvent the wheel? It yeah. sounds like a bit of a, an old wives' tale, but there's often quite a lot of truth in these old wives' tales. Vic, have you heard anything uh, along these no, lines? Other, other than Alan, I know Alan very well. Yeah, I, uh, I actually recognise the gentleman's um, face anyway from around and talk. he did ask me a few weeks ago that he'd heard about it. Um, no, it's a new one on me. I mean, it's worth trying. Uh, those that know Regan in the park, I used to run the Royal National Rose Society trial grounds, which we had here in Somerset. Uh, the next one was in Roth Park in uh, in Cardiff, and then the main trial grounds in in Hertfordshire. But um, we had a strict regime of what was laid down by the Rose Society in terms of the management, right. what fertilisers they had, what sprays they had for prevention, and so on. Um, but it came down, when it came down to things like black spot, I mean, some of the chemicals that we were using in the early days are no longer available anyhow, even for black spot. But all of you know that you get these horrible black spots on the leaves and then they drop off. But they, over winter, and not just for one year, the spores will stay in the soil for a number of years. So this is why they always say, you know, pick up, pick up the leaves if you possibly can. Don't compost them, stick them in the dustbin or whatever. Uh, get rid of them because they just, you know, they overwinter and they come back year after year. So, black spot is quite often uh, 
something you can help simply by improving the conditions they're growing in. Never let them dry out, obviously. Keep them well fed. Um, uh, even a foliar spray if necessary, if it's really bad. Because it, they always say that um, these diseases, like black spot, come in when the, t when the plant is actually under stress. So, um, Vic, can I ask, can it's, I ask it's, a silly it's question? Quite interesting. Can I ask a potentially silly question? When I was a young lad, I remember seeing one of my neighbours along the street in his garden every autumn with yes. an, uh, a dustbin, yes. which he had a fire going in, and an upturned dustbin lid, and he would bake his topsoil. He would take all of his topsoil off year on oh, year. Oh, would he? Oh, yeah, seriously. I mean, he spent hours and days and yeah. days doing this. Oh, yeah. I mean, some Would that have helped in this situation well, if you're well, yes, saying it's it spore-based? Well, it would, yeah. Also, it, would. it wasn't I mean, that some, stupid a question. Some people go to the extremes. Yes, I mean, um, sterilizing soil is one. But, I mean, you've got to be really dedicated yeah. to do... It does happen, as you say. You can buy these portable sterilizers, but uh, I wouldn't go to that extreme. Worth trying. Um, you know, some of these, as you... Um, well, as Phil mentioned, some of the older remedies, but this is a newer remedy. It's worth trying. I'll Nothing to lose, through. really. <laughs> it's watch, this space. watch this space. It's yeah. not going to do any harm, then, by the sound of it, so it's possibly worth a try. Thank you very much indeed, Alan. Uh, could you grab... Who else has got a question for the team? The gentleman at the back there with the cap on. A very good afternoon to you, sir. Thank you very much. What's your question, please? What's your name, um, sorry, first of Jeff all? Jeff Parsons from Trowbridge. Got a large pampas grass... Um, what's the best, mess, uh, best method for getting rid of it, really? Well, you, so, a uh, pampas grass, sorry, pampas for getting grass. rid of it? Yes, because it's, oh. it's, it's about six foot high. And yeah. Do you okay. know the connotations of why people used to use pampas grass in their front gardens? No, no, do, no, I it don't. Get it wasn't it actually well. me that planted it, so it's, I'm not guilty. Do you have a lot of people knocking on the door? <laughs> They used to put them in the front gardens when they were into wife swapping. Yes. Oh my goodness gracious me. Any experience on that thing? <laughs> <laughs> oh dear me. Uh, <laughs> quarter to three in the afternoon. I'm not sure this is entirely the right subject for um, the radio. It would be very but, difficult uh... <laughs> to get rid of because they used to actually recommend that every couple of years you actually burnt them down to the ground. Yes. To actually, and then they would regenerate. So I would say probably the best thing to do is to cut it off at ground level. Once the new growth starts coming, hit it with Roundup or something like that. Yes. And then keep doing that until you actually eradicate it. Yes, because it's next to a wooden fence, so burning it, I think. Yeah, not a good idea to burn it, but cut it down, wait for the new growth to come up and then hit it with Roundup. Yes, thank you. Right. Is, is, it, uh, is, it, uh, hard, is it so hard to get rid of? It, it, it is that quite bad. I mean, you can't dig it out. It's, it's not, you can, but it's... Yeah, I was just going to say, do you know anyone with a digger? An actual mechanical digger. No, That's a if, shame. If, um, if you're really determined to remove it in one foul swoop, a, a mattock and a, a very young, strong man to, yes, to dig yes, all the way around yeah. it and remove it as a one solid lump, but the root ball will be incredibly heavy yeah. and um, it, you'll be left with a massive crater. Right, thank you. All right, thank, thank you. you very much indeed. Well, we are drawing very, very close to the end, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I will ask to see if anybody else has any further questions. Uh, and I believe we have, we've managed to uh, satisfy everybody which is remarkable. Uh, before we go, I would like to ask the three of you, uh, what would you say you should be doing in the garden at this moment in time in the year, please? What would, or what would be the next thing from this point in time? Look at Vic, he's got that microphone straight away. What should people be doing the next for preparation, or now or next? What's next? Thinking in the next spring, Phil. As far ahead as that? Yes. Really? Yes. Um, I actually home in the last few days, and this is late, really. We're pricking out bellus, which is daisies, winter flowering pansies, polyanthus, those sort of things. Yep. Getting it because in October, September, October, they will be going out. Through your letter boxes now, if you're keen garnish, the catalogues will be coming full of bulbs. Right. All your spring bulbs. So if you're going to do, like I could call, traditional parks bedding, 
So let's say you're going to put an ivory white wallflower in. So you've got a base. You want something to contrast. So you're going to go for maybe a black tulip, black knight, something like this. Now is the time to start ordering things like spring bulbs because the earlier you get your order in you know you're going to get what you want yep and you can start planning even if you've not got a big garden you may have a couple of tubs or a patio a window box or something you want to think about a few little tiny spring bulbs lots and lots of them available and it's something you know um over the next few months you can sit in your armchair, look at the catalogue, think, oh, I'll have a few of those, or go out and see Andrew, because I'm sure they'll soon be in, Andrew. Go on, where are you from? They're in, are they? They're in. And, Andrew, remind oh, us, oh, where right. are you from? Do remind us, Andrew. Go on, why not? A little we'll garden well. centre just from outside of Taunton. On the B3257. <laughs> Monkton no, well, Elm. My tip would be, I disagree with Vic, I think this Ooh. time... This time of the year, you should be out enjoying your garden. Uh, <laughs> it's all about sitting out there, enjoying the fruits of your labours. Um, keep your roses deadheaded and sprayed against any funguses and things like that. Make sure all your bedding pots are well fed so they carry on flowering. But the major thing is, please enjoy your garden. That's what it's meant to be about. That so is very true. Don't make it a sort of a horrible experience. Go out there and enjoy it. Darren, what about yourself? Well, Vic's added a bottle of wine now. He was Vic's inside of it. He's getting into the cattle. idea now, isn't he? Uh, well, Andrew stole my thunder, but I think what I'd add to sitting and enjoying it is just have a notebook with you. And because come December, January, March, where you're thinking about the gaps that you saw last July and August, you won't be able to remember. Oh, if you're like me, you won't be able to remember where they were or what your great idea was. So just have a notebook with you now and when you've got an hour think about the improvements or the changes that you might want to make to the garden in the winter so that you're one step ahead and you've remembered what it looks like at the height of summer thank you very much indeed is though i will have one last check are there any final questions oh lady there come with one right at the last minute this will be the last question then if you could tell us your name and where you're from first of all please I'm Leslie Taylor from Western Supermare. Beautiful, lovely. And what is your question for the panel? Can you tell us the best way to prune wisteria? Okay, wisteria okay. again. How can, what's the best way to prune wisteria? Do you prune it hard or do you leave so much? Or? We, we, we did sort of do this question a bit at the beginning, but Sorry. it's okay. <laughs> That's... Um, we've all got a slightly different approach to it. I um, do a sort of a reasonably hard cut back end of September, maybe into October, depending on the weather and how the, the plant is. And I'd cut back to six buds on all new growth and remove any unwanted uh, growth that is historic. And then in maybe February, do a harder prune back to two buds, which will promote a lot of fresh growth and a very floriferous display next summer. Thank you very much. Smashing. Thank you very much indeed. Well, Andrew? Well, before we finish, Vic really would like a question on tomatoes. <laughs> we had a little bet, and I said, I bet somebody says about tomatoes, so I'm going to lose this bet if no, you, one uh, of you can well, actually ask Vic on I, I actually did touch on something yesterday. I've never been able to grow a successful crop of tomatoes. I've come close, but they always end up with black spot of some sort. Always. And they've always come from bags. I've grown them in the ground. I've done all sorts. I've tomorated them left, right and centre. I can never seem to get it right. There's always black spot and I've been advised don't eat it if there's black spot. What can I do? What am I doing wrong? Uh, I, how long have we got, Phil? Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> right. Okay. No, they know I like tomatoes, and I grow, I mean, somebody said, well, I grow five grand. I said, well, I've got 11 different varieties. I grow lots of the heritage ones as well, some of the old, older varieties, and just like the taste of tomatoes. Well, when you say older ones, you mean like Elsa Craig, or is that... Yeah, that's, well, yeah, that's yeah. an old one. That is yeah. an old one, yeah. I do grow Elsa Craig, actually, but no, um, managing of tomatoes, whether it's in pots or grow bags, is not easy because it's, it's mainly all down to the watering, which we right. mentioned, yes, the watering regime and getting your feed right, etc., etc. See, I even went as far as buying one of the automated electronic timers with oh, the piping systems. And you did that? I, I did that. I did, I did that. 
but and I spent a fair amount of money because they're not cheap. No, no. But I still have never been able to have I've, the cherry tomatoes were the only ones that ever yeah. were any of any success. But I, I, again, um, and it's something south facing. You, you can't actually teach. I'm afraid. I'm Is sorry. Uh... I'm sorry, Phil. I mean, mine are just with. <laughs> other than taking the side shoots, that I don't do anything to them. They're probably about seven foot high. They're all outdoors. All out. Right. Easy seven foot high. I've stopped them now, and. It is late this year because we've not had the sunshine, but then now all the varieties are now beginning to fruit everything from black, black opal with little tiny cherry tomatoes up to uh, the large ones. Um, I grew some black ones once and it was most, uh, it was almost, it was, they were very strange. I was like, I really don't think I like the look of these. I don't want to eat them. They taste very good though, Phil. Did they? I didn't yeah, get us. Yeah, I didn't, good. I just couldn't. <laughs> Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, this is the end, then, I guess, of Gardener's Question Time. If there are no more further questions, I'd like to thank uh, you all for coming, first of all. And finally, I would like to ask you all to very much thank our guests today, including Mr. Darren Hawkes, <laughs> Taunton's very own Prince of Gardening, Vic Verrier, MBE. <laughs> and finally Andrew Pittman from Moncton Elm Garden Centre thank you very much ladies and gentlemen you have been listening to Gardener's Question Time on 97.3 Apple FM coming to you live from the Flower Show 2016 here in Vibery Park thank you for uh, allowing me to guide you through these two sessions thank you gentlemen and thank you to you all bye bye for the community of